Hello and welcome to the Business as Usual podcast, which is part of the Edify podcast network. This podcast series is a five-part look at exam technique for the Edexcel A-level business specification. In the five parts of this series, we're going to look at the exams as a whole, each individual type of question, and including some ideas for structure and model answers. My name is Jack Goodrich and my usual co-host is Mike Sawyer. We're both teachers in schools in the UK. This series is just me, but Mike's going to be doing a similar series for Edexcel GCSE specification students and teachers soon. Let's get started. Welcome to this fourth part of this Business as Usual podcast series on exam technique. In this one, we're going to have a look at 10 and 12 mark exam questions. We're going to look at them both together because they're quite similar, although there are some little differences. Just a reminder, this podcast series is aimed at the Edexcel A-level business students the podcast in general is aimed at students of any exam board and GCC as well, but this specific series is about Edexcel A level. So in this series, this is the, this is part four of five. So we've looked at the exams, the paragraph structures, and the questions. We've looked at four mark and eight mark exam questions. In this one, we're going to look at ten and twelve, and then in the final session, which is coming in a few days' time, it's going to be twenty markers. As ever, these are available on YouTube as videos and on Spotify as podcasts. I would recommend the first time you're watching them to watch them on YouTube, as that way you can see the presentation as well. But then later on, if you want to go back to it, Spotify is probably your best bet, especially if you just want to pick up some little tips. The 10 and 12 marker, uh, there are a lot of similarities and so that's why we're, that's why I'm doing them together. They do also appear on all three papers. These and the 20 marker are the only, the only questions that you get on paper 1, 2 and 3 and you'll get two 10 markers and two 12 markers. And they probably, I think, they're probably the most important parts of timing. I think the 20 marker is quite easy to time but these 10 and 12 markers can be a little bit tricky. So we're going to talk about where you may, may, maybe want to focus your time and make sure you get them both done within sort of 22 to 24 minutes. Uh, they can ask for a variety of assessments. They are all assessed questions, but the, the thing that they're asking you to assess can vary. I've got a table that I'm going to go through shortly, which will um, give you a, a bunch of examples of things they might ask. The 10 markers are a little bit shorter. 12 markers will require an extra paragraph and a longer conclusion. I'll go through structure in a moment. But the 12 markers do award more marks for higher level responses. When, I'm going to show you the the grade, the grade boundaries, the marking grids, and you'll be able to see that in level 3 and 4, you get much more marks on a, on a 12 marker than you do on a 10. And so it's therefore important that our 12 markers have that little bit of extra detail to get those extra marks. So our 10 markers on the left-hand side, 12 markers on the right-hand side, uh, the questions pretty much can look the same in terms of they all begin with assess and then I've just given some examples of the kind of prompt you'd get. Assess weather, assess the likely impact, assess the importance. That's going to be the same for both a 10 marker and a 12 marker. And I've put an example there. So for example, for the 10 marker, using the data in Extract C, assess the usefulness of the forecast for a business such as Nokia. So it has those three parts again. Assess the usefulness of the, and then the, the, that would be the prompt. The forecast is the key term and then Nokia is the business. And then the other one, assess the extent to which movements and exchange rates might impact on European hotel operators. So that would be the 12 marks. So as you can see, there's not really that much difference there. They have the same kind of prompts and that, that word assess is the same on both. So you've got to be careful about which one's the 10 marker and which one's the 12 marker in terms of the structure because the structure is different. Ten, I'll start with 10 markers. So 10 markers, you just need one peach paragraph, but you will need to make sure that that, however, is, is fairly detailed, not just one sentence. Maybe you want to expand on that a little bit further. And then you need a judgment. So you don't need a conclusion, you need a judgment. So it's it's effectively a one-line conclusion. You don't have to justify it in huge amounts of detail like we will in a 12 marker. You just need to make your judgment. And so in this case, you would say for this question, and I will show an example of this later, um, you would just say something like, I believe that forecasts are useful for a business such as Nokia. And then you just finish that sentence, basically. You don't need to go into like a particular structure for a 10 marker. 12 markers require a bit more. So they have that one peach paragraph and then they will have another one and those two points must contrast. Now, that might not make much sense now, but when I show you the table about how you can contrast your 12 mark paragraphs, that will make much more sense. So effectively, you need one, you need two peach paragraphs, but only one of them needs to have a however and that that will be the first one. Then for your conclusion, uh, the, the way that we do it at our school, the way I get my students to do it is to do a disco M conclusion i'll talk through what that is as well when we come to the conclusions part later but the key thing there is that your two main points must contrast in order for you to get good evaluation which i'll talk about 
when we look at the the mark grid. So this is the 10 mark one and the 12 mark one is actually exactly the same. There's only one there's the only difference really is in those marks on that left hand side. So as you'll see here to get half marks or above you need to be in level three. Level three is five to six marks. Level four is seven to ten marks. And so as as ever I've my students and I a few years ago converted these into descriptors that link to the paragraph structure that we use. So as you can see there, the only difference between this and the 12 marker is that it doesn't say conclusion, it says judgment. So as you'll see there, level two, if you haven't got a judgment and you haven't got, or you haven't got that, or you've got a poor one, then that would get you into level two. To have a presented judgment is going to get you level three. And then if you've got a judgment that's linked to the organization, that I would say that that's going to help you get into level four as, lo as well as having the consistently linked application, etc. So the 12 marker one is exactly the same in terms of the descriptors that the exam board gives you. It expects the same things for level three and level four answers. But as you can see, instead of getting five to six marks, you now get five to eight marks for a level three answer. And instead of getting seven to 10 marks, you get nine to 12 marks for a level four answer. So that's why we're gonna put a little bit more into our conclusion. We're gonna put a little bit more into that second paragraph so that we can so that we can get those extra marks to get, to take advantage of those extra marks of being available in the high level levels response answers. As you can see on the one on the right hand side, the only thing that's different is I'm talking now about a conclusion with a justification instead of just a judgment. I mentioned earlier about that balanced argument in that 12 marker and we've got our two paragraphs. We've got, as you can see there at the top, paragraph one is a peach paragraph and paragraph two is a peach paragraph but without the however. You can get a, a series of different prompts. So things like assess the impact, assess the importance, assess the consequences, assess the value, etc. And you've got to be paying you've got to pay a huge amount of attention to this prompt because that's what's going to determine the two paragraphs that you write. So for example, if we just take assess the consequences as an example, that first paragraph you might do a positive consequence, and then you'd do a however that would limit that point. So maybe a reason why it's not such a significant consequence. And then you, your second paragraph would be a negative consequence. So as you can see, there's a balance there between the first one and the second one. Positive consequences with a however, and then negative consequences. For another example, if you did assess the impact, you could do one of a few things. You could do positive impact, and then however, maybe why the point you've just made doesn't have a positive impact. And then your second point would be something else maybe that has, or another way that it has a negative impact. You could do big impact, small impact, significant impact, no impact. For an assess the importance question, which is quite common, reason it is important with a however, and then maybe your second argument would be why something else might be more important. So as you can see there, that, that first paragraph needs to contrast that second paragraph in terms of that's what provides you the evaluation. And so it's really important that you pay attention to the words of the questions on these 12 markers so that you're able to balance your arguments. So you need that, that first paragraph, then that little however that argues against the point you just made, and then the second paragraph is going to go on the it's going to look at the opposite side of the argument you'll see an example of this i'm going to do an example of a 12 marker that will show you one of these in practice as well so this is the 12 marker that was mentioned earlier assess the extent to which movements in exchange rates might impact on european hotel operators and you can see from this case that the extract date on the if you're watching this on the youtube version that it talks about um, increases in bookings and holidays and so on. And then there's an extract which talks about the exchange rate of US dollars and euros, two pounds sterling. Now, this question is talking about European hotel operators. And so it's likely to be more based around the euro to pound sterling. Um, but being able to interpret that data is really, really important. So I've, I've picked this one so you can have a little bit of a look at some data as well. So here's an example of an answer. You will notice that uh, there is there is one thing missing. I haven't got a conclusion on here yet because I'm going to talk about conclusions in a little bit to compare a conclusion to a judgment. But I will demonstrate the sort of how I want those those how I get my students to have those two paragraphs that contrast plus that little however in there. So assess the extent to which movements in exchange rates might impact on European hotel operators. So assess the extent to which my two paragraphs are going to be it's going to have a significant impact. And then on the other hand, it's not going to have a significant impact. So I'll, I'll read through my answer so you can sort of have an idea of, of how I've used that peach paragraph structure whilst making sure I'm answering the question. And movements in the exchange rate might have a significant impact on European operators. 
as it will impact on the buying power of consumers in the UK looking to holiday abroad. If the GBP, so the Great British Pound, depreciates, the cost of booking a holiday and paying for goods and services in Spain, for example, any kind of Euro country, or other European nations increases, which lowers spending power. The Great British Pound has depreciated against the Euro since 2013, with the Euro moving from one pound equals one euro 18 cents to one euro 14 cents so that's my data from the case that's my application there and then to talk about how this will have an impact this would mean that holidays abroad cost more and therefore could have contributed to rise in uk holidays from 1.9 per person in 2013 to 2.1 per person in 2017 i'm then going to make sure i've just got a short however to contrast against the point i've just made so however given that not all of their customers will travel from the uk this won't impact on all of their potential consumers for example, consumers from other European countries. So that's going to impact on people coming from the UK, but they're a European hotel operator. Not all of their customers are going to come from the UK. You don't need to go into that in huge amounts of detail for that, however. You can just make that point. Now I need to make sure my second paragraph balances against the one, the point that I've just made. So I've said that it'll have a significant impact, and so my second paragraph needs to be how it might not have a significant impact. So on the other hand, movements in the exchange rate might not have a significant impact on European hotel operators as other factors such as consumer incomes may be more important. So I'm, I'm saying that it might not have a big impact because there are other things that might have a bigger impact. This is reflected in the fact that even though the Great British Pound has depreciated from 2013 to 2017 against the Euro, the number of holidays abroad has increased steadily from 1.2 per person in 2013 to 1.7 per person in 2017. So you can see that I'm using the case study really well here. This shows that other factors such as increasing consumer incomes or more accessible holidays due to increased access to e-commerce may have had a bigger influence. So hopefully you can see there that my two paragraphs are contrasting. They offer different sides to the argument. And so providing I offer a good conclusion to this, I'll have a pretty good answer, which will hopefully get me into that top mark band where we can get nine to 12 marks. Need to make sure we know the difference between these these judgments and these conclusions. So for our judgments, for our 10 marks, I want to give you an example of both. So you don't need the full justification, just that you make a judgment. So an example for that 10 mark that we talked about, the example could be, I believe that forecasts are useful as they offer an opportunity for Nokia to identify trends such as the increase in smartphone consumption. So it's just a, it's a judgment. I've said that I believe they're useful, which was part of the question. And then I've linked it to the business by saying that that's why I think it'll be useful because they can identify whether smartphone consumption is increasing. For the conclusion, you can see how different they are. These require a, a full conclusion. And, and what I get my students to do is use a Disco M structure. So Disco M is on the left hand side there and it stands for decision. And that's the only one that you need on every single every single one. So every single answer needs to have a decision. So you need to look at the words of the question and answer it basically. And then I would say if you can if you can use two of these, then that's great. So two of these other options, sort of ingredients that you can use to fulfill your conclusion and make sure that's justified effectively. So it depends on short term, long term. So it depends on would be if you think that actually it depends on something that maybe you haven't mentioned or you have mentioned and you want to bring that in. Short term, long term might be well, if it's an impact question, for example, you could think that it's going to have a negative impact in the short term, but in the long term, it's going to have a positive impact. And so you could bring that in. For example, if something maybe had a high initial cost but would become profitable in the long term. If you've got other cost implications that might sort of sway your decision and your conclusion, you can mention those. If you've got other factors, you might that, that just sort of gives you the space to bring in something else. And if all else, you might just think about what maybe one point's more important than the other points. And so therefore, even though you might have three points for and one point against, if that point against is really, really important and so significant, that might be enough for you for your conclusion. So for the example of the question that we've just talked about, in conclusion, the exchange rate has some impact on European hotel operators. It depends on how much of their revenue comes from the UK. If the hotel operator relies a lot on UK tourism, it could have a huge impact, specifically in the short term, as there may be a reaction to changing exchange rates among UK holidaymakers. So I've mentioned there that there's an it depends on point because I think it will have some influence, but I do think that depends on how much these U these European hotel operators rely on the UK for their revenue. If they actually get the majority of their revenue from other countries then th and, and don't get very much from the UK, then the UK's currency changes aren't going to be that significant. 
So that's an example of how you can use and it depends on. And I've also mentioned there's a short term factor as well, because I think, you know, if, if consumers are quite reactive to these changes in the exchange rate, then in the short term, that might have a, an impact on their spending. So hopefully that sort of gives you a clearer idea. And this is something you would want to go back to. And th these are things you want to practice. So make sure you can get your hands on some 10 markers and some 12 markers so you can so you can practice the two different types of structure and make sure you know the difference because you should be able to get through that 10 marker with this, with a sort of slightly condensed structure within 10 minutes, which gives you 12 minutes to make sure you've got, you know, that little bit of extra time to add that extra paragraph in and make sure your conclusion's a little bit meatier. Obviously, if you've got any questions, you can get in touch. I'm happy to help you out. So thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube or follow on Spotify if you search for the Business As Usual podcast, or you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We've set up a new Twitter page and we've changed our Instagram handle so that it fits in with the same. So you can find us at businessaupod. Cheers.